Hello, and welcome to Physician Spotlight. I am your host, Dr. Jay Patel. Physician Spotlight is a forum to learn more about our outstanding physicians in the field of nutrition and to discuss important topics and ideas. With the help of Aspen, we are bringing these videos to you. I am delighted today to introduce our guest, Dr. Jose Pimiento. Dr. Pimiento is an Associate Professor of Surgery in the Division of Gastrointestinal Oncology at the Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida. Dr. Pimiento has a keen interest in optimizing nutritional status in cancer patients, and particularly on the use of chemo prevention in the form of nutraceuticals to delay carcinogenesis. Dr. Pimiento, I am delighted to have you here with us today. Thank you for joining me. Jay, how are you? Very well, thank you very much. Dr. Pimiento, can you share with us about how you got started in clinical nutrition? Started when I was in, uh, in medical school. So I'm originally from Colombia um, and uh, medical school is a little different uh, because the last year of medical school in Colombia is actually uh, the internship. So when I was finishing my medical school, we had the chance to do uh, uh, an, an ex external rotation, uh, like an observer somewhere. So I was interested in surgery, uh, but uh, we were lucky enough uh, that uh, Dr. Stanley Dodrick uh, was supposed to go to Colombia. He missed it, uh, but he still let, somehow I got his contact information. So I asked him uh, and I asked his, his staff if I could come and rotate with them. He was at that point in Bridgeport, uh, Connecticut. And I rotated with him for a month, uh, actually for eight weeks. Um, I, I was clear that I needed to uh, do surgery uh, uh, under him. Uh, that was that was a whole different thing uh, because every day you would live and, 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 and breathe nutrition. Um, you would get very complicated patients, uh, all sorts of fistulas. Uh, all sorts of uh, all sorts of nutritional challenges, uh, short bowel, um, uh, acute malnourished patients flowing from different places in the country, and and basically the, the the residency team, the residents were his team. So we had our nutritionist, and we worked in close uh, um, proximity with them, and we had our rounds. But it was basically uh, the the residents would be handling everything. So so that was. That was a kind of eye opening, and I, I I believe that basically everywhere in the country you would just, as part of being a resident, you would write your uh, nutrition orders, you would do your calculations, you would decide which uh, type of uh, nutrition to start on a patient. You, like I thought that that was very normal. That was kind of what everybody did. Uh, but as I did my uh, so specialty in in surgical oncology, it was clear that that wasn't the case, um, and it was clear that 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 basically the, the, the training in clinical nutrition is kind of lacking for, for, a, lot of, for a lot of physicians and, and especially uh, for a lot of surgeons. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of how I got it started. Yeah. You know, it's amazing to, to listen to these stories because what I hear time and again is how these sort of early, um, you know, parts of uh, experience, early experiences in people's career have a lasting impact, you know, certainly did with you, but I would, go even further and say that you really hit the jackpot with your early clinical experience with, with Dr. Dudrick, and you had the opportunity to work with him early in the career. And I, I only imagine that that sh has shaped even how you practice right now. But can you share with us what impact that early experience had on your career development today? Dr. Dudrick was, was one of the philosophy that, that as a surgeon, you would need to be um, capable and able to, to handle everything. So, so you would be in charge of ICU, you would be in charge of the nutrition of your patients. That really um, imprinted on me the need of, of actually look and, and pay attention to detail. Mm -hmm. uh, he was uh, always upset by uh, that sign of, I'll pay you tomorrow. Uh, so you go to a place and you find, well, we'll, we'll get paid tomorrow. And uh, that goes to say that a lot of times when you have this patients that are not eating, that are not receiving any nutritional support, we're always waiting for the next day to start nutrition. Tomorrow they'll eat better, tomorrow they'll get more calories, tomorrow they will not have a test, so they'll be able to eat better. So not, let's do nothing today, it's fine. And then tomorrow comes and then you're doing something else. And then the next tomorrow comes and then you're doing something else. And the next thing you know is that you're 10, 12 days down the line, the patient's albumin, um, that is a lead marker, is now one. 
uh, the patient is uh, hungry, doesn't exist anymore, they cannot walk anymore, and now you're starting to think in saving them with TPN. And he was always um, flabbergasted by how we would every day replace uh, electrolytes, uh, but never think in, in replacing calories and never think in replacing albumin, never think in, in looking globally to the patient, but looking at everything else. Yeah. So that, that was, that was um, fundamental for me. Then I was lucky enough that I came to do my fellowship uh, here at Moffitt, and one of my uh, mentors, um, uh, a pancreatic surgeon, was working in uh, vitamin uh, um, uh, E chemo prevention of pancreas cancer. So I actually stayed an extra year doing a lot of work uh, a lot of work on chemo prevention uh, in the lab and, and in the clinic uh, with some clinical trials that he had run in and that his name is uh, uh, Dr. Malafa, Mokengi Malafa. He's a surgeon and he's interested in, in the basic science of, of the intervention, but funny enough, is 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 the same, is nutritional interventions to optimize patients. So marrying everything a little bit um, just kind of helps me uh, understand that that there is a need uh, to look at these patients early and often. Uh, remember that they are always in deficit. Uh, remember that they're always in, uh, especially cancer patients. I do a lot of esophageal, gastric, and pancreas. Uh, so uh, that is mostly my, my practice and, and, the, and the division that I oversee. Um, and I oversee the inpatient, uh, the inpatient uh, surgical team as well. Yeah. So, so that that is the risk of malnutrition or, or, or the, the current malnutrition is, is universal. It just happens to everybody. And despite early um, interventions and despite uh, best um, efforts, uh, we're, we're always behind. Um, so, so that has uh, impacted uh, the way I practice. And, and one of the first things I looked for when I was already an, an attending is uh, to look at uh, how the nutrition or lack of, or lack of nutrition impacted patients outcomes, especially undergoing no adjuvant therapy. And it was fascinating that um, even when you intervene, but intervene late, like when you let them get behind and then you put a feeding tube down the line because now they're 15, 20 pounds uh, lighter. Um, and you just say, you know what? Let's just do oral supplementation and let them be. Just let them be for now because they, they get better. If, if you don't recognize these patients that are, that are struggling in the beginning, um, they don't respond to therapy. You treat them, you give chemotherapy, you give radiation, and, and their tumors are not responding. So, so it's clear that, that, that chemotherapy is needed, that uh, radiation is needed. Uh, but more importantly, you need good substrate to be able to respond to those therapies that you're giving to the patients. Yeah. Um, so because we, we keep looking at things like sarcopenia and finding out why these patients just being psychopenic. We're giving them the same treatment that everybody else and they do poorly. Uh, we are looking at frailty as a different marker for malnutrition or for nutritional risk. And we see how these patients do poorly, regardless of what we do, despite anything we do. Um, so so all those all those early um, all, all those early examples, all those early lessons. Um, I, I think I just relearned them every time I see a new question. Yeah, no, and listening to you talk, that, that was a remarkable story. And what I'm really amazed by, um, Jose, is, you know, the richness of the not only clinical experience that you had early in your career, but also the, the laboratory, you know, experience you had. And so you got to kind of see it from bench to bedside, you know, if you will. And the other thing that's really sort of remarkable in listening to, you know, the, your interest is... You're almost using nutrition as a form of neoadjuvant therapy to help augment chemo and radiation, you know, therapy. Can you talk to us a little bit more about, you know, what you mean by chemo prevention per se, and what specific um, things you're looking at right now um, as, you know, uh, chemo prevention? Okay, so 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 uh, for chemo prevention, we have again in in, in Moffitt, we're extremely lucky because. Uh, Dr. Malafa has led um, that work for for many years, actually, um, and uh, he's he has one of the uh, um, only pre-surgical trials with vitamin E, um, and basically the idea um, was to have a window of opportunity trial, where before the patients were going for pancreatic surgeries, they were receiving these high doses and increasing doses of 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 uh, one of the of, of the compounds of the vitamin um, of the vitamin E, especially called deltotrienol. 
And uh, I was lucky enough to, to be involved with that and to see at uh, first hand um, how difficult it is to actually uh, design this, uh, these um, uh, trials uh, with, with chemo prevention agents. Um, and uh, and uh, the, the more, uh, the, the, the striking thing there is that we, we were seeing very significant early um, uh, results in, in, in necrosis of the tumors. Uh, but the problem, especially for chemo prevention uh, with uh, uh, any natural compounds is the fact that that is so hard to study because they are not clean uh, pharmaceuticals. They are not uh, drugs that you can actually say, okay, this is the target. This is the specific effect. You confirm that you block this and it happens. It's only hitting this. Uh, what you can do with a tyrosine kinase or what you can do with different things. So, so it, it was just striking uh, how, how um, complex uh, the field was. But when, we, when we're talking about chemo prevention, what you would want is uh, to identify the group that would benefit the most. So you would say if they were going to work in people that are just the general population at a low risk of something, uh, how we can give a medication, drug, an intervention, um, a, a vitamin, um, and see if we can decrease the incidence of a certain uh, type of a cancer or an on a wanted effect, uh, disease-wise, uh, that you, you can think about. Um, specifically for cancer, you can also look at people that are at higher risk, mm -hmm. people that have had cancer and now are at risk of developing, for example, in colon cancer, a second cancer, a second polyp. They, 30, 40% of them within a year will have something. Yeah. And in those people, how you can prevent from them getting a new neoplastic process. And then in people that already have had cancer, later stage, then how you can intervene so you can prevent recurrence. And that is something similar to what we do with adjuvant therapy, although again, we are more clear of what those targets are. The problem that we have in the field, uh, specifically of chemo prevention with natural compounds, is that all the studies that are done, despite having thousands and thousands and thousands of patients, have given no results or opposite results, yeah. where you would give the chemo prevention agent uh, with very good theoretical uh, basis, a uh, very good preclinical data, and actually the results show that cancer incidence increases. Yeah. So what that shows us, more importantly, I think it is that we just don't understand. We just have a hammer, and we know that the hammer hits things, and we know that the hammer hits nails, and we're just trying to hammer everything, and just keep hitting and hitting, and hopefully one day we'll hit the right thing. But we just don't know exactly how to better choose the patients that are going to benefit from such intervention. Something that comes to mind is we know uh, the population in the U.S. Um, has significant, uh, despite obesity, despite morbid obesity, despite high rates of obesity and, and, and overweight, we know that significant portion of the population has micronutrient deficiencies. We know that those patients have significant vitamin deficiencies. We know that those patients are malnourished. We know that when you look at all forms of, of, of adequate cellular functioning, it's not working right. We just don't know how to put that into an actual way of treating patients, so we solve their problem. We know all these patients have vitamin, what, 30% of, of females have mm -hmm. vitamin D deficiency? And, and now we're not even checking for that anymore. So yeah. we used to be checking and trying to replete and trying to have them have people going out in the in the, the sun a little bit because we're all scared of melanoma and we should be, but but we don't want to be in the sun. So so now we have these competing things and now we're not checking for vitamin D anymore. So we have all these deficiencies that we're not addressing. Yeah. So it's no, going I... to come, it's going to come up on that we, we we hopefully will understand. So we can start intervening. Uh, but right now the data is dirty. Right now the data is opposite uh, is telling us that we should not just give everybody a high doses of vitamin X, uh, vitamin Y. We, we should not uh, because we don't understand why, but uh, uh, of, of uh, antioxidants. We don't understand why, but patients are not mm. benefiting from it. So we need to get smarter in when to intervene, how long to intervene. But, but there, is, there is hope, especially knowing the data from things like aspirin that actually seems to work really well if you give it to the right patients yeah. uh, to decrease polyps and things like that. 
Yeah. No, it sounds, you know, like there's a lot of work that needs to be done and you're just sort of scratching the surface. But, you know, I'm happy to see that you remain on the forefront and, you know, you have many questions to sort of answer and you certainly have the, the training and, you know, the, the ambition to answer, you know, some of these questions. And so I really look forward to um, what you're going to accomplish over the next, you know, few years. I just want to shift gears for, for one moment here and maybe ask you, you know, sounds like you've had just wonderful mentorship, you know, throughout your career. And so what words of wisdom would you offer someone who's say, just starting out and is interested in clinical nutrition, but just doesn't know where to begin? So, um, and, and I think that is the theme of Aspen. Um, I think that the theme of Aspen is, is our, our interdisciplinarity, uh, but it's actually, uh, so the first thing that you need to see is for, for kindred spirits. Um, mm -hmm. There is going to be kindred spirits uh, in, in your institution. There is going to be people in different uh, specialties. There is going to be people in different, um, in different uh, uh, professions all over, uh, from nutritionist to pharmacist um, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, other uh, so specialties, uh, physical therapy, that are going to be interested in similar things that you are interested in. Um, that can start um, be the, the, the ground where you can start kind of from the from the ground up start kind of working in, in things that that interest you ways to better take care of patients. Uh, so that is that is locally. Uh, locally also you can have uh, different so specialties, uh, ICU teams, uh, pulmonary critical care, trauma that are naturally interested in nutritional interventions just from the standpoint of what they do every day start nutrition, stop nutrition, a gastroenterology interested in uh, early uh, enteral access, um, and see and, and go go and talk to them and, and try to see the interest that they have and what they have going, uh, what the experience they have and how you can partner up with them. Uh, because I can see how being an internist, um, not having how to access patients' uh, uh, stomachs to, to start nutrition early can be kind of daunting and, 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 and stressful. I talk to interventional radiology, see what, what, what kind of resources you can have locally. Uh, yeah. That is, that is the, the first layer. Then uh, as you go uh, beyond, uh, there is always educational opportunities in Aspen. There is always people interested to, to, to have them pick your brain. Uh, we always are, are willing to, 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 uh, to talk to somebody and kind of help guide um, and kind of help them solve their interest and see how we can connect them with people that may be locally. Um, there is the Aspen, uh, there is the Aspen directory. Uh, you can always look there and see if there is somebody near you in your institution that you don't know, you have a similar interest. That, that happened to me a few years back uh, when finally so, somebody that was working uh, in Aspen, uh, we found each other in a meeting and we're like, <laughs> what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And you start talking and it was just somebody that, that our paths didn't cross because um, he works in the ICU mostly and I don't. So I, I, my patients are mostly in the floor and an outpatient uh, and I, we never, we never cross paths. And then we're like starting to work together and collaborate. Um, but, but there may not be the expertise in your institution. Uh, it may be uh, an exported expertise. And I think all of us are willing to, to, to talk to somebody. And, and I think uh, Aspen is always a great uh, resource to, to, to look for, uh, uh, people that may share your interest within your specialty or a different specialty. And additionally, uh, if your institution has uh, maybe very good lab-based uh, people, you, they may have labs that are going on, they may have a lot of basic science research, you may need more help with the clinical aspect of it. So you look in Aspen for somebody more clinically oriented. And the opposite is true. You may have uh, somebody uh, that is interested in the lab elsewhere, and you have some clinical questions that may be worth bringing into somebody in the lab and that 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 just cross pollination among uh, between institutions um is 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 helpful and this kind of efforts where you're trying to kind of make people more available through through um through uh the spotlight the spotlight uh, is helpful to, to see if they find somebody that can help them with their interest yeah and i don't know if i don't know if you have any comments i think you mentor also a lot of people so you may have a lot of thoughts in that regard as well yeah, no, I agree. I think that it, mentorship is a bi-directional process uh, as well as bi-directional, you know, benefit. But you really touched on some really important, um, you know, words of wisdom, if you will. 
uh, you know, the first thing that I'm that I'm listening to is, you know, utilize the strength of um, of Aspen and uh, facets of individuals' own, um, you know, institutions. Uh, but particularly within Aspen, it, it it definitely is an organization that, you know, as you nicely mentioned, you know, brings together people from all different disciplines, uh, multidisciplinary sort of type of work to kind of foster development and to exchange ideas to just, in, you know, move the scientific needle when it comes to um, clinical nutrition. I think it's very important to, to recognize that we all have blind spots. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Thank you. It may be in the same, in the same discipline and across disciplines, we have blind spots and we have blind spots um, uh, across cultures. Yeah, no, I think you hit the nail on the head when he just said that, you know, it's also our responsibility, not only as individuals, but also as an organization to help, you know, bridge some of those gaps so we can start figuring out some of these problems that, you know, cross cultures and, and, and institutions and, um, you know, nations, you know, for that matter. So Dr. Pimiento, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, it has been a real honor in just um, talking to you and learning about, you know, your um, experiences, your interests, and just how you arrived uh, in the clinical nutrition space. I would also like to thank Aspen for their partnership for this forum. Thank you very much for joining us today. And wherever you are, have a wonderful day. Thank you, Jay. It was great.